Hey, Outlet, how are y'all doing? I hope uh, you guys are doing good. I hope y'all are uh, not going stir crazy during this quarantine. Uh, but I hope that you guys are using this time wisely. I hope that you're using this time to, to read. I hope you're using it to pray. And I hope you're using it to spend some time with your family. Because when all of this is over and done with, our lives get so busy and so fast that sometimes we forget that there's no such thing as too much quality time with our family. So I hope that you guys are are enjoying all of that, but we're going to we're going to jump right into things and we're going to pick up where we left off Sunday where we were talking about the kingdom of God. And while we're talking about this, I want you guys to think on three questions. I want you to to think about how has God's kingdom come in the world in the past? How has God's kingdom come in your life in the past? And what are some things that attract God and bring his kingdom to earth? And when we begin to talk about this, what, how God's kingdom has come in the world in the past and what's going to bring his kingdom to earth, we really need to, to look back a little bit at the early church and understand what happened and, and how things uh, came to pass. So we're going to look real quick at the first century church. And I want to look at the people specifically in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Because they were in this upper room and they were acting in obedience, out of faith, on the words of Jesus, without any prior manifestation of anything like this happening before. They didn't know. They had a promise, but they really didn't know what this promise was. Something was about to happen. And you see, Jesus told them the Holy Ghost and fire would come and baptize them. And we see that in Acts chapter 1 verse 5 where it says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. See, he didn't say when it was going to happen. He just said not many days hence. He didn't say tomorrow. He didn't say next week. He just said sometime in the near future you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. He just told them to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of, of this moment. And the crazy thing about it is they obeyed his words and waited. You know, so many times we can't wait five minutes for something. We can't, we can't wait on God to let his word come to pass in our lives because we want it right now. The generation we are, we have to have it right now. All of our information, everything that's going to happen has to happen right now. But here, we see them going, not having a promise of when it's going to come, just a promise that it's going to come to pass. And they obeyed his words and they waited. And you see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 13, where it says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath's day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room and upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zealot and Judas the brother of James. They were all there just waiting. So this was obedience to Jesus telling them they would be witnesses after the they would be witnesses after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So, so here they are, and they're waiting, and they're, they're wanting to see what happened. And then all of a sudden, they are filled. They're, they're in unity together in prayer. They have one mind and one accord. And while they waited for the kingdom to be manifested in them, they just prayed. They waited, and they prayed. And after being filled with the Holy Ghost, Peter stood up. And became a witness to all who would listen. He shows that he shows his obedience to Jesus telling them this, that they would be witnesses after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They all became witnesses and thus began the first greatest manifestation 
of the kingdom of God. And it just continues to grow. And the unique thing about it is they understood that God had to get the glory for this. You see, the apostles knew that now they had a power about them. That the Holy Ghost had rested upon them. This power is here. And the apostles knew that the power did not come from them, but was from God alone. He was the only one who received the glory when they did things in his name. You see, Peter told the lame man he had nothing of worldly value. But what he had was power and authority in the name of Jesus. And we see that in Acts chapter 3 verse 6 where it says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked again. And God got the credit for that because Peter knew when he said, in the name of Jesus Christ. He didn't say in my name, in your name. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Because when we speak the name, the power comes from that name. The power that is in our lives is manifested when we speak the name of Jesus Christ. We see Saul, who is also called Paul, we, we see where he persecuted the church and they were afraid of him. Yet even though Saul was intimidating, Ananias' faith and trust in God's ability made way for Saul's conversion into an apostle. And we see that in Acts chapter 9, beginning at verse 12, where it says, And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call unto thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me and thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and rose and was baptized. You see, the, the early church was committed to giving their lives for the gospel. You see, Ananias knew who Saul was. He knew that he had the authority to bind him up. He had the authority to persecute him. He had the authority to kill him. But yet, because God said, because his Lord said, Go and lay your hands on him. He goes in there and tells him because God said it, because the Lord, even Jesus said for me to lay my hands on you and you'll receive your sight and receive the Holy Ghost. And he does that even in the face of danger. And again, we see where in the early church, they cared more about the kingdom of God being manifested than their own lives in the life of Stephen. See, Stephen had so much faith in God's kingdom and in the gospel of the kingdom that he had to, the courage to preach to the synagogue that had stirred up against him, that had believed a false witness against him. And even in the faith of God, he or even in the faith of death, he honored God. And then we see where Paul, he left tradition, position, and power to be an apostle of God. He went through many trials, but he still said none of it mattered if he may win Christ. None of it mattered as long as he made it to the finish line. And then we look, we jump ahead and we look at the 20th century church. Like the early church, those who were a part of the Azusa Street revivals had, had been hearing the word of God as they read and preached the events of the book of Acts. 
They began to seek God's presence and pray for an outpouring like that in the New Testament. Their obedience to the word of God led to the birth of the modern Pentecostal movement. What followed was a mirror of the book of Acts. Miracles, signs, wonders, and preaching that proclaimed Jesus and his gift of the Holy Ghost as essential to salvation. These people were not rich. These people didn't put on shows. They simply prayed worship God, inviting his presence and his glory into their lives. Many sacrificed much so the gospel could be spread. God's kingdom came in their lives because they placed him, his word, and his presence above all else. Because to them, nothing else mattered. And now we look at the 20th, 21st century church. And according to the prophetic facts of the Bible, we are living in the times of the second coming of Jesus. The Bible prophesies in Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and in Acts chapter 2 verse 17 that in the last days God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. It has been preached for decades that there will be an outpouring greater than that of both the first century church and the 20th century church. And this is based of, on the concept that the latter reign of the church will be greater than the former reign. And we see this because there are things happening around us right now that we may not be able to explain, but we know there's, there's something in the atmosphere. There's, there's, a, there's something that is, that is about to break loose in the kingdom of God. And when it does, this, this revival that we've been waiting on, this revival that we've been praying for, this outpouring of the spirit that we've been, that we've been yearning for here in Columbus is about to be poured out. And we need to understand that because right now we're coming together and we are, our church is, is, is coming and we're, we're spending time in prayer and we're in one mind and one accord and we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And not only is it possible for the greater days to come to the church, but it is worth every sacrifice that we can give to make sure that that latter rain comes, that the kingdom of God is manifested here in us. You see, A.W. Tozer once said, anything God has ever done, he can do now. Anything God has ever done anywhere, he can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you. You see, we're not insignificant people. See, if when we're operating and allowing the, the kingdom of God to, to manifest itself through us, anything can happen. Those, those places where we've seen these revivals come and people begin to pour into the church, we see it there, and because he did it there, he can do it here. We see where where young people are going out and they're laying hands on people and they're, they're winning people to God. He's done it before. He can do it again. He's done it over there. He can do it here. He's done it for them. He can do it for us. But the thing is, if he's going to do it, we have to put him first. See, an important characteristic found in both groups from the past is God was first. His word his ways, his presence were more important to the early believer than anything else. It was more important than money and fame. It was more important than family and tradition, more important than comfort and ease, and more important than their very own time. It didn't matter what they had to sacrifice. The kingdom of God, making God first, his word, his ways, his presence were more important than anything that they could sacrifice. Another vital characteristic that resounds throughout each story from these two, these two eras in time is obedience. When God spoke, early believers obeyed. When God called, they responded. They obeyed even when those around them criticized them. They obeyed even when they were persecuted and people laughed at them and people made fun of them. They obeyed. 
They obeyed even knowing that it would cost them everything that they had. No price was too great to obey the word of God. And finally, their faith activated them into action and drew God's presence to them. They believed that God would do what he said he would do through his power alone. They believed it would change them and their world. They believed that nothing could stand in the way of God's plan. And they believed it would be worth every sacrifice. You see, they knew that God, what God said was going to come to pass. They knew that his word did not return void. They knew that a promise that he had planted had to bloom. It had to come to fruition. It had to happen because God spoke it. And when God speaks, things happen. You see, we have to be willing to invite his kingdom into our lives, into our world, into our society. God's prophetic word will come to pass and he will use a group of people to be conduits for his kingdom to come here on earth and his kingdom to come here in Columbus and at River City and in the outlet. Whom he chooses will depend on us. Who will place God above everything else? Who will obey no matter what? And who will believe that God alone holds the power? We need to know tonight, when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're not just saying some words. We're not just repeating something. We're saying, I want you, God. Above all else, I want you. I want your ways above mine, your thoughts above mine, and your plan above mine. This means saying no to less important things. This means pushing aside those things that we thought were, were big things in our life to do something for God. This means submitting even when we don't agree. There will come times when God tells you to do something that you think is crazy, that you think is outside of yourself. But if you will obey and agree, when even when you don't think it's, it's the right thing to do, God's kingdom will begin to manifest in your life. This means believing when impossibility is all we can see. Because when we trust God and step out in faith, we'll begin to lose sight of the impossibility, but we will begin to, to see what is possible through God. We need to know that God is looking for someone to create a place for him and his presence in this world. He wants to pour his spirit out like never before, and he is doing that in many places around us. We see you as we scroll through Facebook, and we see it as we scroll through Instagram, how churches are baptizing people daily. And again, if he's doing it there, he can do it here. We just have to be willing to let God manifest himself through us. He is searching for a vessel that, that is asking for his kingdom to come. And tonight, Outlet, I ask you the simple question. Will that vessel be you? Will you be the one to say, no matter what, God, use me. No matter what the cost is, God, operate through me. No matter what people say about me, have your kingdom manifest in my life. Manifest your kingdom through me. Let people see you through me. So right now, I want to take just a few moments and I want to pray. And what I want you to pray, I want you to ask God to, to help you to be a conduit for his kingdom. Help you to, to put him first and help you to obey his word and, and help you in your faith to believe in what he can do in your lives. Let's pray, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity, God, to come and gather together, even if it is just through screens, God, through social media. Lord, we, we thank you for the chance to just come and hear your word, God. 
Lord, right now I pray over each and every young person, God, over each member of the outlet, Lord, and those that anyone that that happens to watch this video, Lord, I pray right now that that you begin to work in their lives, God, and you begin to help them be a vessel for you to work through. God, I pray that they begin to have something flow through them, that, that grow in them, that they want your, your kingdom manifested in their lives. They want your kingdom to, to begin to show itself in their world through them, Lord. God, I pray right now that you that you begin to, to help them to, to see what you're what you have going on, God. And I, I pray right now that you that you help them to, to obey your word and you help them to to seek out your word and begin to get these things for themselves, Lord. And I pray right now that you begin to instill just a little bit of faith in them to believe what you said is going to come to pass and that to believe that when you say it, Lord, it has to happen. God, right now, I pray over these young people and I pray over of, over River City and, and Columbus as a whole, Lord, that you would begin to pour your spirit out, God. Lord, keep us in this time of uncertainty, Lord, and give us give us comfort and give us peace, God. But give us faith, Lord, and help us hold on to your promises, Lord, that you will see about us and you will take care of us, God. Lord, I praise you and I worship your name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Outlet, I hope you guys take this and run with it and begin to let these things sink into your life and into your heart. And you begin to use it to to get your walk closer to God. Again, I hope that you guys are doing well. I hope that that you are spending your time wisely. And please, once again, let me and Sister Eller be here from you. We want to know how y'all are doing. We want to know what's going on. We, we just want to we just want to hear from you guys. You know, it just like I said the last time, if you just need to get out for a minute. You know, let me know if it's okay with your parents. You can come hang out with me for a little bit, and we'll we'll be quarantined together in the house. But it'll give you an opportunity just to you know relax for a minute. So I hope that you'll take me up on that. And let us hear from you. I love each and every one of you, Sister Ellerby. Loves each and every one of you, and we miss you guys. And we hope you have a wonderful night.